Welcome to the tutorial on machine learning for remote sensing data analysis. Today's tutorial is given by myself, Devi Stuya, and by Gustav Kamsvals. I'm the person on the left here, I'm from the University of Zurich, and I will be in charge of the English version you will be listening in the next hour. Professor Kamsvals from the Universitat de Valencia will be in charge of the Spanish version that you can also find and download on the GRSS website. Today's presentation is organized in four parts. So first, we will have an introduction where I will detail the processing chain for remote sensing and the challenges that images and processing raise. Then I will have two big thematic, part, thematic parts, one on supervised remote sensing image classification and the second on the retrieval of biophysical parameters. We will then conclude with some remarks, some pointers to the bio bibliography and links to relevant source code. Let's get started with the introduction then. So remote sensing image processing is basically extracting information from data recorded by sensor on board aircraft or satellites. If I had to summarize the different use we can do of this, uh, of this data and which type of information we generally extract, I will summarize everything in three main groups. So the first one is to monitor and model the processes occurring at the surface and their interaction with the atmosphere. The second one is to obtain quantitative, quantitative measurements and estimation of geo and biophysical variables, for example, water quality or chlorophyll, fluorescence, and so on. The third will be the identification of the material observer themselves in order to turn them into land cover or land use maps. These three groups can then be found in a large variety of applications. Here we have a list that is by no means exhaustive, but you can see that it, we can touch things as different as precision agriculture, uh, sea on ice uh, studies or forestry, or land management. So this is just to give you a glimpse on how wide remote sensing can reach and how different problems can we uh, approach through remote sensing. The images we acquire with remote sensing have some specific characteristics and each sensor has its own. But we can find some general trends that I will like to briefly discuss with you. So the first thing someone thinks about when we talk remote sensing is the concept of resolution. So images can be characterized by many different types of resolution, the most well known being the spatial and the spectral resolution. So the spatial resolution is the size of the pixel in, uh, in meters or, or centimeters, and it gives, it, uh, it's related to the amount of details that we can see on the image itself while the spectral resolution is the resolution of every single spectral band. So how many nanometers of the electromagnetic spectrum are covered by the band? So the more bands, uh, the higher the spectral resolution. Generally, a high spe spatial resolution comes with a moderate spectral resolution. So if we want to have a lot of spatial details, our spectral bands will have large ranges of wavelengths. On the contrary, when we have a high spectral resolution, so for example in hyperspectral imaging, we generally have moderate spatial resolution, which brings a lot of problems like mixed pixels, so the fact that in one pixel we will have several materials recorded and their signature will be somehow mixed, or if we are working on the detection of targets, the targets will be smaller than the pixel itself, so its detection will become much more difficult. But it's not only spatial and spectral resolution. We can also talk about temporal resolution. Now the satellites are revisiting more and more often, or we can use drones to come back to the same place more often, which means that we have now time series of images. And we also have satellites that can look at the same place from different angles, like in the figure on the right. So this means that we will we'll have very high dimensional data with several spectral bands taken at several time steps and possibly with dif on, from different angles. If we add that we have different type of sensors, so different multi or hyperspectral sensor, SAR or LIDAR, well, the, the amount of data sources is very high and this makes our classification problem much more difficult. Especially because the feature relation become more complex. With higher resolution, we can actually observe things that are more, uh, more, more non-linear and non-Gaussian. 
which actually justifies the use of more complicated methodology as those that we will we see today. Then we can also note that uh, e even if we have more and more sources of data, well, the amount of field samples that we can, uh, can, can acquire remains the same. So actually, for a higher amount of data, we have the same or just a little bit more uh, labeled information, which makes uh, the estimation of the models more difficult and actually calls for more robust and regularized models as those that we will see later on. Last but not least, we have been talking about a lot of data in size, in volume, in, uh, in, uh, in revisit. So we will have a lot of challenges in storages and processing in near real time. So these are the characteristics of our data and I've briefly described the, the challenges that they raise. Now you can see that to answer to these challenges, we must live at the interface of several disciplines. So staying only in the image processing part, I will say that remote sensing image processing lives at the interface between image processing itself, computer vision, signal processing, and machine learning. And in the rest of this tutorial, we will see how we can make these four fields live together and take the best out of them. OK, let's now go through uh, the remote sensing image processing chain. So if we go from the acquisition, to the final product that the user will be using, well, we'll we will go through uh, a series of steps that go uh, from stage to transmission of the data recorded from the satellite down to the to the ground, then some pre-processing to have the most uh, usable and discriminant uh, bands or feature, and then uh, a real processing part which will we actually generate the product itself. So let let's just go through all these different. Uh, all these different steps into these nine uh, uh, steps. So the first one, uh, one would like to consider is the selection of the best features. Meaning that if you, if you receive now an image that has several spectral channels, you probably want to keep only those that are really relevant for your problem. So you, will, you could want to develop a methodology to process your data in order to tell you, hey, this channel is the most important to detect uh, to the, the 10 bricks or to, to model chlorophyll. So keep this one and the other ones you can remove. The second one is pretty similar. It's called feature extraction. So instead of selecting the best feature to perform a task, we want to extract combinations of them that are really discriminative. Or uh, for example, methods that are very known for this are the principal component analysis or a discriminant, linear discriminant analysis. With this type of methodologies, we, we will actually recombine our spectral channels in order to make them really align to the quantities we are trying to estimate. A third uh, processing task that is very popular is what in other fields is called super resolution. And in remote sensing, we tend to call that pen sharpening. This means that if we have one very high spatial resolution panchromatic bands, meaning a single band with high spatial resolution but a very low spectral resolution, we can actually combine it with some color bands coming from a multispectral image that have less spatial resolution but that has narrower uh, spectral ranges. So we are combining one grayscale image, a high resolution, and a separate color bands with lower spatial resolution to get a product that is high spatial resolution, and has the color channels. The fourth uh, processing task will be what is called segmentation. And this means automatically find group of pixels in the image. So it's detecting the objects, for example. In the example on the left, it will be how to extract every single field in the image. The fifth task is what we call estimation or retrieval. And it's the estimation of geo and biophysical parameters, for example, temperature, leaf area index, or chlorophyll, using the spectra that I am seeing from the satellite. The sixth one is called spectral and mixing, and uh, is, has been pretty popular with uh, hyperspectral imaging. So we have said before that each pixel, since the spatial resolution it tends to be not so high, has a mixture of different materials inside. 
So the idea of vector mixing is to actually have an estimation of what is the mixer inside the pixel. To know that 30% are crops, 20% are, are other types of agriculture, and 50% are man-made inside a single pixel. So unmix what is observed. The seventh task is coding, uh, which, which is actually the task of compressing the image from the storage uh, in the satellite uh, through the transmission to the ground. So we want to compress the image as much as possible by losing as little information as possible. Task number eight is noise removal. So for example, uh, if there is some sun glint, we will have some spectral distortion or uh, sometimes we have sensor transmission failure, so the image will have some black stripes. And we want to correct from these errors or noise before providing the image to the analyst. And last but not least is task number nine, which is here called parsing. Uh, I will call it classification personally, and this is uh, how to assign semantic classes to objects. So pixels, patches, or regions, objects, we want to know what they are. We want to know, like in the example on the left, that one is a road, one is a village, one is a soil, and so on. So these are the nine uh, tasks, one main task one would like to perform while working with remote sensing data. And in the following, we will concentrate on two of them, which are in red now. So we first talk about classification, so task number nine in the next part of this tutorial. And then we will talk about the estimation of geo, biophysical parameters and variables in the third part. Let's talk about supervised image classification. So what we want to achieve is basically what you see on the slide. We start from a grayscale image, multi-band grayscale image, so we have B bands, and each band looks a little bit like the image on the left. So we have gray values, we can have uh, as many values as we have radiometric resolution. And uh, what we want to achieve is actually to simplify this uh, data space in the, in the space of real numbers by the number of bands into something much simpler, which is a limited number of classes like the image on the right. We want to nail the image down to, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 thematic classes that will actually mean something for the, for the analyst. In the example on the right, we are classifying the image into buildings, towers, grassland, bare soil, and streets. Okay, so it's really um, a product of uh, image simplification, let's say, where uh, we want to make a product that is useful for an analyst. Where do we need that? Well, we need it typically in land cover application when we want to know what are the material we are observing from the satellite, or we can also use it in post-catastrophe assessment if we want to know which buildings have been destroyed or which areas have been flooded. Military applications are very fun for image classification, and in urban areas also, we generally, generally urbanists tend to use land, land use maps to assess uh, urban growth or to define their new uh, policies. So why do we need image classification at all? Because if we look at the image, well, it will be easy to say, oh, come on, this is a building, this is a tree. Well, we are very good at detecting objects and at doing object recognition, but the computer actually it sees only the values of the pixel. It sees a stack of numbers for every pixel. One number per spectral band it, it has. It, does, it even doesn't have any ob notion of objects a priori. So basically, we need to teach the machine how to recognize objects so that the object can do what we can do very easily with our brains, but in a very large scale and detailed way. So there are many, many models to perform image classification. And I wanted to, to share with you a couple of taxonomies, just to, to have different groupings of the models that exist before entering into specific models. So the first taxonomies I want to, I want to discuss is the one uh, on the top of the slide. So it's a, it's a distinction uh, based on the, need of the amount of supervision that you give uh, to the model. So it goes from supervised method on the top left, where the analyst has to provide to the machine the, some labeled input output pairs, meaning that the analyst needs to tell 
this pixel is a tree. So when you see this type of, of values in the bands, the object you need to classify is a tree. And we, we can go to the other end of the spectrum of supervision to unsupervised methods, where we actually no, do not give any label to the machine. So we only give the image to the machine, and the machine has the task to find by itself the natural groupings that occur in the image. So it's, uh, it's more tempting because uh, the analyst doesn't have to provide any labeled information, but it's much more difficult actually to get what we want from these methods because the unsupervised methods will give us the groups without telling us what they are. And then the user has to make sense of it. And sometimes it can be confronted to groups that contain several types of objects or semantics that the user was not interested in. So supervised have the methods have the advantage of providing to the analyst exactly what the analyst wants, the classes that he wants, uh, stemming from the examples that the user, him or herself, has provided. So it's, it, it, there are methods that lie in the middle, for example, the semi-supervised methods, which actually use a little of labeled input-output pairs, but mainly exploit the big amount of unlabeled samples. The second taxonomy that uh, I wanted to discuss is the distinction between parametric and non-parametric met methods. So parametric methods, they assume a particular density distribution, meaning that we will assume that the data or the class uh, dependent distribution are Gaussian distributed or another type of distribution. So a method like the linear discriminant analysis or LDA makes an assumption on Gaussian distribution of the classes. While non-parametric methods, on the right, they do not do any assumption about the data distribution, meaning that they just take the, the data as they are, and they compute distances between data points or all kind of quantities in order to define the classification decision function. So they don't assume anything about the uh, data distribution. So. Among these methods, we have k nearest neighbors or KNN, decision trees, random forest, or support vector machines. So now, uh, in red, you have seen uh, four methods in this taxonomy, and these red methods in red are those that we will be discussing in the rest of this part. So we will have first the linear discriminant analysis, then the k nearest neighbor. Then we will move briefly to the random forest classifier and spend some time the SVM or support vector machines. All right, let's start with the linear discriminant analysis, uh, which uh, if I need to describe it with a single sentence, I will say it fits a Gaussian to each class data and then classifies the rest accordingly. So in this slide, as much as in, in the following ones, when you see some text in a typewriter font, this means that this is the MATLAB code you need to use to run this model. So for the LDA, you can see that the MATLAB code is pretty simple. It's just the function classify, uh, where you give the spectra of training sample, X train, the classes of this same training sample, Y train, and you predict some samples which are in X test. The function classify will give you a vector called YP, where you have actually the prediction for all your test samples. So it's as simple as that, and what the model does is that it basically takes the training sample the analyst has given and try to model them as Gaussian, as ellipses, and as in the figures below. And once the ellipses have been defined, for each test point it will look which uh, is the ellipse the point belongs to with maximal probability. There are two variants, the linear and the quadratic model, one builds a linear decision function, and the other a nonlinear one. The second model I wanted to briefly present is called the k-nearest neighbor. So if I had to describe this one with a single sentence, I will say that to tell the class of a sample, it will look at its nearest neighbors, and depending on their classes, it will give a prediction. So if you look at the image below, you will see that if we do, do a tree nearest neighbor prediction, we will be in the solid circle around the green points. So the tree nearest neighbor of the green points are two red triangle and one blue square. 
So the green, the green circle will be classified as a red triangle. However, if we think to a five nearest neighbor classifiers, we are actually in the dashed circle around the green point. And if you look at the five nearest neighbors, actually three are blue squares and two are uh, red triangles. So if we consider a five nearest neighbor, well, uh, we will say that the point is a blue uh, square. So basically it looks at the neighbors and assigns the majority class among the neighbors. It's a, it's a slower method than the, lay, than the LDA because uh, for each sample it actually recomputes the distances to all the trained samples. Uh, the value of k is up to you, so in the example below of the MATLAB code we put the k value of 1. The higher the number of k, the slower it gets and the, uh, the most general it, get, it gets. But if you put the k which is too big, well, you will start not to be discriminative because you are, you are not looking locally, but you are looking very globally. So k is up to you. It's, it doesn't have to be 1, as in the example here. And you generally validate it to, with a validation set and then use the specific, uh, the specific parameter. The third model I wanted to discuss is the random forest. So the random forest has become very popular in the in the recent year because it works extremely well. It gives you no linear uh, classification, and it is also conceptually pretty simple. So it basically builds a lot of model, a lot of trees, I will say, called decision trees. And decision trees are actually uh, models that classify pixel with a set of linear decision functions and uh, then uh, once these trees are, are trained what happens is that you give a, a test point and it classified with each tree that has been trained and depending on the response of each tree it takes the maximal class so if 10 trees say it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an agriculture pixel and 5 trees say it's a building well the final response will be that it is agriculture. So the final decision is a vote over the single tree responses. The more trees you put, the better it is, because you will have much more vote and you will be more general, but it may, will make everything slower because you have to train a lot of trees. Another parameter that you can play with is the depth of the tree, so how deep it goes before taking a decision. So more depth uh, will be a little bit slower, it will give you better prediction, but try not to overdo it, because if we if you go too deep with, with your trees, you will overfit your training data, and you won't be able to predict on unseen test data. So you have here the, butler, the MATLAB code is two lines of code, the tree bagger function is a built-in in MATLAB, and it works very well. In YP you will have your prediction, and in scores you will have actually the metrics of all the votes that you had for all the pixels. Let's move to the fourth and last model to be discussed in this uh, in this section. We'll take a little bit more time on the SVM because uh, because it's uh, one model that has been very popular and very very effective for remote sensing. So if I had to to summarize SVM with a single sentence, as you can see, the sentence becomes much more complicated. So I will just read it out to you. So a super vector machine is a known parametric kernel method that fits an optimal linear hyperplane separating the classes in a higher dimensional representation or feature space. Of course, this sounds very complicated and I've put some colors there for you. You will see why in a few slides. And I will discuss these three points one by one and I will start with the red one, which is the fact that the SVM builds a linear hyperplane. So a linear hyperplane is basically an hyperplane, so a line in this uh, two-dimensional example you see here, that separate our data in two groups. So we have the red class and the blue class, and we want to find the line that better separates our data. So our line in this case is uh, the one uh, you can see right in the middle, and uh, the SVM actually maximizing the separation between the two point clouds by this line meaning that it wants to maximize the width of the green uh, line you can see here. This line here is called 
the margin. And the width of the margin is 2 over the norm of the parameters of the model. So if you want to maximize this, this is the same than minimizing the, the square norm of the parameters. Very well. So we know that in order to have this classifier, that is the one that maximizes this distance, we want to minimize the vector w, so the, the square norm of the vector w. We want to perform perfect classification, but this is not always possible. So we actually add some penalization for errors. So we allow the model to make some errors, and every time we make an error, like in this case here, we will penalize by a certain fac factor psi of i, i being the index of the point to be penalized. So basically, the decision function becomes a minimization of the square norm of the parameter, so we want to have the best possible planes split in the data, but we are not too harsh, so we allow some penalization, but every time we make a mistake, we penalize a little bit, you see here. So basically, since we want to minimize everything at the same time, well, we want the largest possible separation with as little errors as possible. Very well. So then uh, there are some maths that I will let you look in relevant literature, but I just want to, to show you the final decision function. So if you want to, to predict one unseen point, let's call it y star, okay, which is a function of a point x star. It's basically a linear decision function, so w transpose by x plus b, okay? And this corresponds to a sum over all the training sample of the similarities between the points. So it's each paired similarity between one training point xi and the point to be predicted. Okay, what does that mean? It basically means that when we are predicting for if the point x star be belongs to the blue class, we will look at the distances between the points in the blue class. Then we will do the same for the red class, and we, we will assign to the points that is, on the average, closer to one class. So in our case, the, the point will be a blue one, because it's closer to the blue one points than uh, to, the, to, the, to the red point. Note that there is this alpha i parameter that I put here in red, and this is called a super vector coefficient. And this is non-zero only for the points that lie on the, on the dotted line here and here, and for the classification errors, which means that for most of the points, we just don't use them for the decision function. That means that the solution is sparse and therefore is computer, computed much faster. So we use only what we call the support vectors, which are the points that, that lie on these two parallel lines and that actually support the decision function. All right, now we know that the SVM is a linear classifier, but what happens if we want to, to make some nonlinear prediction, like in the example here on the top left? It is just not possible to separate the circle from the squares with a line. So the solution of the SVM is actually to project the data in a higher dimensional feature space, here on the top right, where the data become linearly separable. So you see, here we have moved from a 2D space on the left to a 3D space on the right. And on the 3D space, we can actually run our linear classifier here and separate the circle from the squares easily. When we have found this separation, we can actually look at it in the, in the original space, and we have performed non-linear classification by using our very simple linear classifier we already knew from the beginning. So, how is that even possible? Well, uh, the idea here is to find out this projection function phi, but it can be pretty difficult to find it because actually there are infinitely many possible candidates. There are all kind of uh, projection that project to a higher dimensional space. What we want is basically to continue using the sample in the original space, so not calculating the projection explicitly, but still get the projected solution. But this sounds impossible because we don't want to project the data, but we want to do as if we had projected the data. But luckily enough, this is what happens when we use kernels. So what is a kernel? First of all, 
A kernel is a function that corresponds to the projection from the original space x to the projected feature space phi of x. Very well. So if we compute a kernel between two samples, so like here, k between x1 and x2, this is exactly the same as computing their dot product, so their similarity, in the projected space. And this is very nice, because if you remember what we have seen before, let me go back to that slide, the decision function of the SVM depends only on similarities, on dot products between the samples. So actually, by using the kernels, we get the similarity we need, but in the projected space. If you look at two examples of kernels here, the kernel RBF and the kernel polynomial, we can see that actually their expression uses only points in the original space, and it doesn't use at all the explicit projection of the sample. So it means that if we compute the RBF kernel between x1 and x2, we are basically computing their distance, their similarity, in the projected space by using the original sample. So we are actually achieving what we want. We don't project them explicitly, but we get their distance in the projected space. So now, if we go back to, initia, to the initial uh, sentence I used to, to describe the SVM to you, I hope it makes a little bit more sense. So it's a non-parametric kernel method, because it uses kernels there in green, that fits an optimal linear hyperplane, so wx plus b, that separated the classes, but not in the input space, but in the higher dimensional representation or feature space, which is this phi of x. The good thing is that we never compute phi of x explicitly, but we use the kernel between the original space. By doing so, we get a nonlinear response using the, the points in the original space and the linear method. How, how do we do that in MATLAB? Well, first of all, we go and get the libsvm library at the address that you can see on the slide. And then we simply have two functions, one that trains an SVM and one that predicts with the model that comes out from the SVM train. So SVM train uses the, the training samples and labels as all the methods we have seen before and has a series of parameters. So uh, minus s basically tells that you're doing classification. Uh, minus t defines the type of kernel. So in the example here, I put an RBF kernel, a Gaussian kernel is the same. And then you have two parameters, gamma and c. Gamma is uh, related to the bandwidth of the RBF kernel. So it actually make the, the Gaussian bell uh, narrower or larger. And C is the tolerance uh, to error, so how much you penalize your classification errors that you are ready to accept. When you have a run SVM train, well, you have a model that comes out, and you just put it as an argument in SVM predict that will give you the predictions for uh, a vector X of test. In the function, you see you need to provide a Y test as well, which is a vector of labels. So if you have it, it will give you a pr uh, an estimate of the accuracy together with the predictions. But if you don't, don't worry, just put a vector of zeros and disregard the, the estimate of accuracy because it won't mean anything. But you will still get your prediction that are what you will need for your analysis. Okay, let, let's just see an, uh, quickly an example of uh, these different classifiers we have seen. So it's on a multi-spectral images with nine uh, classes in Zurich, and it has been taken by the quick burst sensor. So we have four spectral bands plus 22 special features. So we have, I've instructed some features with mathematical morphologies, and we have stacked everything in a single vector and perform a classification. So depending on the number of training pixel you give to the classifier, here we have 115, 255, and so on, we'll get uh, an accuracy, a different accuracy for the different methods. So linear discriminant analysis, for example, here, will give us a 72% accuracy, while the K and N will give us 75 and SVM 83%. So SVM seems to work pretty well for in most cases, but uh, it's, it's particularly good when we have little training sample, because it's a regularized method and it, goes a, and it does a very good job. The K and N, yeah, uh, it does a very good job when you have a lot of training sample because it's easier to assess the um, 
the neighborhood relationship when, when we have a lot of training samples. When we have just a little, well, your neighbors have a, li a high likelihood to become, belong to a different class. We have an other methods that we haven't discussed, like neural networks here or single decision trees, but basically this table shows you a comparison between parametric and non-parametric methods of different kinds. Here you have the classification maps for the different methods, so you can also appreciate uh, how uh, the different methods do uh, their job, and you can see that the SVM is pretty close to the reference, it's making some mistakes on the commercial centers, which are pretty tough, uh, but the decision function is pretty smooth, much smoother than from the neural nets, for example. Okay, uh, why this, this method work well, in particular SVM and random forest? It's because they are regularized method, meaning that they prevent solution to go to over complex uh, prediction and they try to keep, to keep it smooth so that things that look alike tend to be uh, predicted in the same way. Okay? SVM does it naturally because it, it maximizes the margin and this ensures some regularization and avoid solution that overfit. Random forests also do it because they do a vote over several decision trees. So if one decision tree makes a mistake, actually this mistake is just erased by the rest of the, um, of the ensemble of classifiers. But sometimes this type of regularization is not enough. So we can in enforce more regularization by using different additional approaches, such as those that are listed here on the list. So we can, for example, reduce dimensionality by performing feature selection and extraction. We could actually regularize by a certain property of the data by encoded invariances, and we'll see an example in a second. We could also impose spatial hom homogeneity of, of the images, because we know that pixels that are spatially nearby should be of the same class. Well, we could, we could include spatial information and take advantage of this knowledge. We could also use the, the information contained in the unlabeled samples and not use only those that are labeled. In this case, we go into semi-supervised learning, but we won't talk about it today. And we could also uh, use multiple data sources at the same time. And in this case, it will be uh, what we call multimodal learning. We won't talk about it today, but I invite you to read a very recent paper by Gometova and Al in Proceedings of IEEE, where you have a very thorough review of uh, strategies for multi-sensor, multimodal learning. Okay, but let's let's go to the, the encoding of the invariances. So let's start with a, with a synthetic example. So here in this example, I want to classify these two classes, okay? And these two models are actually equally good. So this classifier separates our blue and red class very well, and this model separates these two classes very well too. I want to know the response for this green sample. And I also have some prior knowledge is that I want to be invariant on the horizontal dimension. Okay? For some reason, I know that the prediction must be invariant in the horizontal dimension. How to, so the question is how to add this knowledge into the model. So we start by running DSVM uh, as usual, okay? And uh, DSVM will actually give me this solution. So we will have two support vectors here, and this is the best hyperprint separating the data. So given this decision function, the point will be classified as a red circle. But now we also know that we must be invariant on the horizontal dimension. So one very easy way to add this knowledge is to take our super vectors, and to add some synthetic example that take into account this invariance. So since we want to be invariant in the horizontal dimension, we actually can add new artificial samples along the horizontal line for each of the super vectors. And if we retrain with these eight examples now, well, the new decision function will be this one. And our point to be predicted will be this time correctly, we hope, predictly, predicted in the blue class. Okay, so this is, this is pretty theoretical, but actually uh, I want to give you a real example with the same image we, we saw before. So it's again this, um, this quick image with 18 spatial features, and we have our nine classes. 
So in this case, we encoded invariance to rotation because we don't really care if a, if a building has been rotated a little bit or if the road goes uh, east to west or north south, it's always a road. So actually the rotation is something we want to be invariant to. So basically we run the SVM, we take the super vector and we rotate them by uh, 90 degrees. Okay, so we actually generate synthetic examples which are simply rotation of the original patch around the pixel to be predicted. We retrain the model and we jump from 76% accuracy to 83, just by this very simple trick, because we have added invariance to rotation. You can have more details in this in the IEEE Geoscience Remote Tensing Letters paper by its squared over digger et al. You can see the reference at the bottom of the slide. The second thing uh, about regularization I wanted to talk about is the its regularization about multi-source information. So we have seen that at the beginning of the course, we can have different sources of information. We can have optical images, radar images. We can extract many types of contextual information, for example, by using spatial filters, a local mean, a, lo a local standard deviation, some entropy, and so on. So why, why not using together all this information to improve the classifier? I mean, why sticking only to the optical image we have? So our first idea to do that would be to take, if the images are all co-registered, we could take one pixel at location x, y here, go through all our sources and stack all the bands together. Okay, so you will make a huge vector with the optical, the radar, the spatial features and so on. So we just put all the variables together and we run one single classifier with all these variables all together. So this is, a, this is an idea, this works, but the risk is that we handle feature spaces of very high dimensionality. And also, well, we start to compare peers and, and apples because we're computing distances with things that are that have very different meanings. So another idea will be to use some properties of kernel methods. So the property is as following. If we have two kernels, K1 and K2, their sum is also a kernel. If you multiply a kernel by a value that is positive, the resulting kernel is also a kernel. This is, this is great because it means that we can also compute a kernel on the optical data, compute another kernel on the radar data, another on the contextual information, and so on. And then we can sum them all with some weights as well, if we want, so we could put uh, some parameters and have something that can still be used in the SVM. So we are actually tailoring the kernel parameter and distance, so it's metric, to the type of data, and we just sum at the end the best combination possible. And this has been explored in many papers, so I just mentioned two here, uh, a transaction geoscience and remote sensing from Kamsval et al. in 2008, and another transaction on geoscience and remote sensing in 2010 uh, by myself, where we actually use this property to build kernel combination and get the best output out of it. So here you have a comparison of some methods. Uh, so the, the first one here is just using an hyperspectral image and putting it into an SVM for, uh, for this, this case study. So we get the precision of 81%, which is not bad. It's far from being, not, from being bad. Secondly, we use some spatial filter computed on the first uh, principal component analysis extracted from this, the image, and we, we get an improvement. We are at 89% in accuracy, so it's, pre it's pretty good. But what happens now if we do perform this combination, so we have two kernels, one from the spectra and one from the spatial, we combine them and run a contextual SVM. So now we get the best of, two, of both worlds and we have a precision of 97%. And then there, there are some more optim optimized methods so with some generalized uh, composite kernel that uh, allows us to, to gain again a, a little bit. But the idea is if we combine different sources of information in the kernel function, we can actually get a great improvement in, pre in precision. I mean, here we are having an improvement of 16% by stacking these two data sources, which is a great improvement in my opinion. Very well, uh, I will now stop for the classification part. So just to summarize a little bit, 
I just want to, to, to remind that, well, the problems we are considering are challenging and they are very often high dimensional. So uh, what we need here are statistical approaches. We have seen some supervised approaches in this, in this part of the tutorial. And I've put a lot of accent to the kernel methods because they are the current state of the art and they, have, they are naturally regularized, which makes them very successful. But of course, if we add more information in the classifier, the result will improve. So if you have more samples, for example, by synthesizing virtual super vectors, as we have seen the performance become, become better, especially if we encode something that is meaningful, like an invariance to rotations or scale. If we have more minimum, meaningful feature by including spatial contests and things like that, it will go better. If we have multi-temporal information, let's make use of them and more sensors. So if you want to know more about all that, I, again, uh, advise to have a look to this uh, multimodal learning paper from Gomez Shova and al. in Proceedings of the IEEE 2015. It's very new. And uh, there you will have some uh, glimpse and idea on all that. We will now move on the third part of retrieval. When we talk about retrieval of biophysical parameters, we are actually meaning a regression task. A regression task where we want to predict a certain biophysical parameter that can be temperature or crop yield, biomass or chlorophyll, starting from some spectra that are observed by a satellite or an aircraft. So in order to make this prediction, we need uh, some in situ measurements. So we need a team that has been to the field and has recorded at the same time the biophysical parameter of interest, so chlorophyll measurements, and the spectra at this specific location, for example, with a, with a field radiometer. Then we, we obtain an image from the satellite, and we want to build a model using the in situ spectra and chlorophyll values in order to map the entire image and having the chlorophyll estimation over the whole area. To get there, we have two processes that can be used in, in, in interplay. So one, the first is the forward modeling, which is a model then starting from biophysical parameters simulate spectra. So we have a, a, set, a given set of biophysical parameters, chlorophyll, DFR index, atmospheric properties, and we use a physical model to simulate what the satellite should be seeing given this biophysical parameter. The counterpart is called inverse modeling, and it's here on the right. And given some real satellite recorded data, we want to invert the spectra in order to know which one were the biophysical parameters that generate them. In other words, we have the spectra and we want to get to the chlorophyll. So another way of representing this is by this, this, this diagram, where we have on the left here the biophysical variables, chlorophyll and so on, and on the right, the spectra of remote sensing. So the forward problem here goes through what we call the radiative transfer model, which is a physical model that takes the variables and simulates you the spectra. The inverse problem, which is here at the bottom, goes through what we call a retrieval algorithm to convert the spectra into the variable of interest. In the rest of this tutorial, we will focus on, the, on retrieval algorithms we, uh, to get to the variables of interest. Okay, there are three main families of retrieval uh, algorithm or inversion methods. So the first one is the statistical inversion models. And this one are those that are the closest to the machine learning. And these are also those where we will, uh, I will spend most of the time in, the, in this tutorial. Second are the physical inversion model, which use uh, are the radiative transfer model and to generate some synthetic sample and then try to inverse by nearest neighbor match. We will see them uh, after. And as a, as a third family at the end of the course, uh, I will discuss briefly some hybrid uh, solution where we can use statistical and physical models at the same time to get the best out of both worlds. But let's start with the statistical inversion models. So there are two big uh, approaches. The first is what we call parametric regression, and the second is what we call non-parametric regression. So parametric regression are model based on uh, an, an explicit model for retrieval. It means that we compute a certain index, 
that is related to the biophysical parameters we want to estimate. For example, we can use the NDVI, or we can use the PRI, the photochemical reflectance index, or uh, indices that use more bands like the TVI or transform vegetation index, and so on. So we compute an index and relate to the biophysical parameter of interest. The second approach is called non-parametric regression, and this time we do not assume any explicit feature relation through indices. We just take the spectra as if, as if they have been observed by the sensor and use them to train a regression model. They can be linear, for, for example, a least square regression or a read regression, or non-linear, for example, using a random forest as that we have already seen for classification, or a support vector regression, which is the regression counterpart of the support vector machine. I will now give you one example for which one of these three families, and I will briefly discuss the weaknesses and the strengths of each one. Let's start with the parametric regression. So to show you the parametric regression, I decided to use the NDVI, which is an index that is widely used in remote sensing, and I am sure that you know it from the other tutorials that you have been following. So if we take a color infrared image like the one here on the left, that I show you also in a stretched version, so you can see better the colors here, we can compute the NDVI index by using the, in the near infrared and the red bands, using the equation uh, in the middle of the slide. So the NDV NDVI index map will look like in the image in the middle here. So very bright means very high values and also means high vegetation. Very dark means very little NDVI values and means actually no vegetation at all. So you can easy, easily see that if we threshold this map to a certain value, like here, 506, we can see which areas are vegetated and which areas are not. We can see it in the image plane or in a scatterogram between the red and the near-infrared bands. So this is a very simple way to estimate a, bi a biophysical parameter of interest that will be the presence of vegetation. So parametric approaches um, are simple and comprehensive. They require very little no knowledge from the user, so they are actually pretty, pretty appealing, especially because they are very fast, they have practically no memory requirements involved. So they have been very successful in the past, but we also should remind some little weaknesses that they can bring. So the first one, which is probably the biggest, is that they use only part of the spectral information available. They don't use all the spectrum, they just use some specific band and combine them into an index. So if the bands themselves are noisy, they, the method will be sensible to noise. And uh, that, I mean, the problem is actually that we put boundary condition on these chosen bands. So we decide which bands are useful and we discard all the rest of the information. We use only one variable at a time, the index that we have been extracting. And if the atmospheric correction has not been very successful, well, the index is, has the risk of being not portable, meaning that on different images it will uh, behave differently, meaning that the threshold will vary from image to image. And finally, no uncertainty estimation are provided. Never. Let's now move to uh, non-parametric uh, methods. So I will now show you uh, the least square linear regression, which is one of the simplest models to do uh, bio biophysical parameter estimation. And then I will make it non-linear through kernelization. Okay, so the model we want, to, we want to, to do is here. And this is a classical linear regression model. The classical y equal ax plus b, okay? So y here is the vector of uh, output, so the chlorophyll values, if you want estimated, uh, I mean, no, sampled at n locations. So we have n samples with chlorophyll. X is the vector of inputs. So we have the same n samples because each these two must correspond. And we have the dimension, meaning that we have the spectral bands from the spectrometer, okay? And so we want to estimate Y by combining X with some weights, which tell us which band is important and how is the combination. So we want to find the best W possible. And we found it by, by considering this formulation here, which is the minimization over W of two terms. The term on the left here in red 
is a, a reconstruction error, meaning that we want our prediction, x times w, to be as close as possible as the real values of chlorophyll. We want to predict well, we want to be close to the real value, okay? But if we minimize only this, we have the risk of overfitting, so to be, to be super precise in the prediction of the training sample, but then not being very good on the unseen test samples, because the function becomes super specific and we have no smoothness. A smooth function has more chances to predict well when we are similar to the training sample, but not exactly the same. And to enforce smoother function, we add a, regu a regularization term here. So it's exactly as in the SVN. We have a regularization that tries to keep the W matrix, so the weights of the model, as little as possible. So it, it tries to depend as little as possible from the training samples. And we have an error function that tries to predict well. Okay? So it looks very much like the support vector machines before. And these two terms are in, are in competition. So this one wants to be as good as possible in training, and this one wants to make a, me a, mod a model that is really general and will be very good on both training and test. Okay, the good news is that to minimize that, we can do that in closed form. So if we minimize that and set to zero, well, the optimal weight parameter is derived with this expression here. That depends only on the input variables and on the output. So it's very nice when we have our W uh, extracted from the training sample, we take the test sample and we can predict the chlorophyll everywhere else by just multiplying the spectra by the weight vector. In MATLAB, this is five lines of code that you can see here. And the first is just decided the size of, of our data. So it's basically four lines of code that represent these two uh, steps. So how to get to the W matrix and then how to predict on new unseen examples. Okay, this works well, it's regularized, but it's still linear. So as for the SVM, we want to make it non-linear through kernelization. And I mean, the recipe is pretty much the same. So here we have exactly the same formula as before, but instead of having x, we have phi, which is the projection of x in the higher dimensional space, same as we have seen with the support vector machine. So our model is to predict y by multiplying a vector w to the, predict, uh, the projected data, okay? We have the two same ter terms here, so one that wants to predict well on y, and another that wants to have small coefficients on w to be as smooth as possible. So what are we doing here? We are basically doing the linear least square regression in the projected space. It's actually very similar to the support vector machine again. So uh, by doing the math, we have again in closed form how to uh, get into the dual weights, the A, which are the alphas in the SVM. And you see that they depend on the kernel matic matrix between all the training samples. And when we have these A dual weights, we just uh, we can retrieve the the primal model weights by multiplying the training sample by a. Okay, why is that relevant? Because when we want to predict on new samples, so we want to get the prediction vector y underscore t, we will multiply the projected test data to the weights in the Hilbert space. But we actually don't want to compute the projected data, as in the SVM. But since we know that the weight corresponds to this expression, if you replace w by the same expression, we will get to the multiplication between these two projected vectors. And if you remember from the SVM, the dot product between projected vectors is actually the kernel value using the original samples. So this can be replaced by the kernel, between the test and the training points. And we have again the solution in closed form. So if it looks complicated, you can look at the MATLAB code and it's again, five lines of code. So you compute a kernel in train using your favorite kernel building function. Then you compute the, alpha co the A coefficients by implementing the formula above. Then you compute the kernel between the test sample and the train sample. And when you have the A weights and the test kernel, you multiply them together and you get a prediction that is nonlinear because it's linear in the projected space, but nonlinear 
in the original space. Okay, so we have seen two methods for non-parametric uh, retrieval, and they are not perfect. They also have their weaknesses and their strengths. So I will go through through them briefly. So uh, the, the, since we go through training, this can be computationally expensive. And uh, if we don't regularize well, so if we don't fit well the lambda parameter, well, we can still overfit our training data and be very bad when predicting at test time. For this region, reason, we will need some ex expert knowledge for tuning this parameter. But fortunately, toolboxes are starting to appear that automate some of these steps. However, well, it's a black box, so you get a, you put your spectra in and you get uh, an output, but you, you lose a little bit the physical meaning of all this. But on the, on, the, on the bright side, we use all the bands at the same time, so you use all the information. The models are adaptive, they can be nonlinear, and if you regularize well, they are accurate and robust at the same time. They can cope with noise, they can cope with redundance, and all the computational cost is in training. So then if you have to test on very large data set, you can do it easily. Some model can provide feature relevance and uncertainty estimation, which is something very nice. And there is one model, two models, the, the Gaussian process regression and the kernel ridge regression that I invite you to, to read about because these two will give you some estimate of the uncertainty of your prediction. So let me give you an example on chlorophyll estimation. So the data are uh, data from the SPAR campaign in 2003 and 2004 in Spain. We have 135 samples, okay? We have spectra with 62 bands, equivalent to the, to the CRISPR proba. And uh, we basically measure chlorophyll with the CCM, okay? And we, uh, we predict the chlorophyll using 50% for training and 50% for validation. I remember well. So we, we compared a variety of models here. So here on the top you have indices, so parametric model if you want, in all this part. Here we have the least square regression, so the linear model I've been talking about. And on the last part we have three non-linear, non-parametric regression model. And here you have the R square of the prediction in all cases. So we can see that when we use indices, quality of the prediction of chlorophyll varies. Uh, we have R squares that goes from 0 0.7, 0 0.6, up to 0 0.8 in some cases. But when we go to non-parametric model, actually is where we do a real jump in quality. So with the linear model, we get up to almost 0 0.9 in R square. And when we do a non-parametric and non-linear model, we have a, a, an almost 100% uh, R square. So a perfect prediction of the chlorophyll on the test samples. We can then visualize it. So this here on the left, you will you see the the chlorophyll prediction map from the Gaussian process. And uh, actually, what I told you before is that the nice thing of the Gaussian process is that it gives you an estimate of the uncertainty of the prediction. So basically, here everything that you see in bright color are areas that, where the prediction is uncertain, meaning that you should not trust too much the prediction in these areas, especially because they are, they are in areas of bare soil. So the, the prediction of chlorophyll can be a little bit bad. And so uh, we can use this map actually to mask the areas that are too much uncertain, then have a chlorophyll prediction map only in the areas where the model is sure of what is it predicting. Okay, that was for the statistical inversion technique techniques part. I hope you still have some fuel for a few slides. Uh, I will briefly now talk a little bit about the physical inversion techniques. Uh, mostly for letting you know that they exist, because this is not my area of expertise. But basically, uh, when we want to, to make physical inversion, uh, what, we, what, we, what we do is that we rea rely on a relative, a relative transfer model, which is this model that simulates the spectra starting from a given set of biophysical parameters. It, this, is, uh, this is very appealing because it's based on, on, on physical models, so it takes into account the, phys the physics of the, of the process and has been validated in many cases. We can also change several physical models to make it multi-scale. For example, in forestry, there are people chaining canopy level models to leaf models and so on. So this, is, this is, has a, a, a lot of, uh, of interesting properties. 
But basically, I mean, if you have to, to, to nail it down to, to the two parts of the process, I will say that again, we have the forward and the inverse mode, okay? So first we run the forward model for a wide range of situations and configuration. This means that we vary the values of the biophysical variables, so the chlorophyll, the LAI, the atmospheric parameters, we vary them and we simulate a lot, millions of spectra that will be observed by this specific combination of input parameters. Then, when, you have, when we have the, the, simulated, uh, the simulated spectra, we actually use them to inverse uh, the observed real spectra. This means that we take the observation and we try, we try to find the most similar in the millions of spectra database that we have simulated. So there are two main ways for doing it. So one is by numerical optimization. So we calculate the RMSC between the measure, measured and estimated spectra and we optimize numerically or we do what is called a lookup table. So we, we pre-compute the reflectance for all this uh, wide range of combination of parameter values and then we make a nearest neighbor search. So this means that we have one million of spectra observed, we have the spectra we want to match, well we compute the, the distance one by one and we take the minimum. And then we predict the chlorophyll as the chlorophyll of the best match. So as you can see the physical approaches are computationally very expensive because we have to run the physical model for millions of samples, and then for the inversion, is a nearest neighbor search, one versus everybody all the time. So parameterization is required, optimization is required, and uh, we also want to, to, to have a good prior information, so you need to know <laughs> very well your physics in order to put the boundary conditions on parameters, and uh, if this, uh, in, on one hand, we limit the computational load of the whole model because you will restrict the number of parameters being observed. It also uh, prevents you to observe situations that are out of the boundaries that you have put. So actually the bounds are hyper important because if you say that the chlorophyll can, can, cannot be bigger than X, well, you will never predict a chlorophyll bigger than X, okay? But on the bright side, well, these models have a very good reputation because they are physics-based and they, they are apply, applicable globally because they are based on reflectance, so they are very little affected by atmospheric correction and, and so on. And you can have information about the uncertainty of the prediction via the residuals. Okay, finally, there is the third family, which is what we call the hybrid inversion models. So what is an hybrid inversion model? We are basically using the RTM to create the millions of, uh, of uh, artificial spectra, and then we use them as training samples for our regression model. So we are actually using at the same time the advantage of the RTM, so we have, uh, we have input data that are physically relevant, but we, we, we use the computational efficiency of the statistical non-parametric method that can then predict using all the simulated, simulated data in an accurate rate and very fast, okay? So, um, I, I wanted to conclude actually by showing you uh, a toolbox that is called the ARTMO, so that stands for Automated Radiative Transfer Models Operator, and that you can download at the link here above, ipl.uv.es slash Artmo that actually corresponds to these hybrid models. So it's a, it's a toolbox uh, with, a, with a MySQL database behind where you can basically do the forward modeling. So you can see here how to generate spectra with a, with a radiative transfer model. So we have a, you have a whole pipeline to go from combination of biophysical parameter to actual uh, simulation of spectra that you can see here on the right bottom panel. And after you have trained your radiative transfer model, you can basically use the simulation to run parameter regression, non-parameter regression, or physically based inversion. So you can actually invert using every possible of the three families we have seen above, and you can also do the forward modeling. 
and then up you up to you to decide which data you use to perform your regression. So it's a very comprehensive toolbox where you can use all the concepts we have seen in this tutorial today. In summary, for the retrieval of biophysical parameter, I would like to stress that this is a very important and challenging problem in remote sensing. It has been somehow obviated for, for a long time, but now there are, there, are, there are the tools and the computational power to have nice machine learning methods to cope with this, uh, with this estimation problem. We also have sensors that carry enough spectral information to, pro to, to, to train this model and have an accurate prediction. I think about hyperspectral methods. And we can actually move from approaches based on indices or uh, based on few spectral bands to something where you really uh, make use of the whole richness of the spectra. So not all, all everything is solved. We still have the problems of scalability, too many data, and the fact that we work in very high dimensionality, sometimes even with thousands and thousands of features. And we have some first bricks of solution, typically the hybrid, hybrid approach and to, to work with non-parametric sparse learning machines. If, you're, if your uh, fingers are tingling, I invite you to read this very recent paper by Johan Verrells, that it's a, very, a comparison of very different types of methods based on machine learning. Uh, for uh, for estimation uh, of uh, of chlorophyll, and uh, I I found this paper very inspiring, and I hope you will be also. Let's now move to the conclusion of the tutorial. It's now time to wrap up things and conclude with some final remarks, pointers to source code, and other resources. So today we introduced machine learning for remote sensing image processing. And among the different tasks that we are confronted to, I focused on two, which were image classification and biophysical parameters retrieval. For each one of those, I reviewed the basis, shown some methods, and provided some MATLAB code so that you can try them out of your data and see what their benefits can be. Now you have everything you need to start working on your data. And if you need more ideas and resources, I can recommend the three following paper on these slides. So the first one is by Gustav Kampswall and colleagues, and um, it details the recent advances in hyperspectral image classification. The second one by Luis Gomez Chova and colleagues, it tackles more the problem of using simultaneously different data modalities, so different data sources, multi-temporal remote sensing, and so on, and gives a lot of future direction and ideas. The third by Jochen Verels and colleagues, well, I just mentioned it, it's a review on uh, biophysical parameters retrieval. Beside these very focused papers, you have a variety of books that you can consult for uh, going back to your basics or more advanced concepts. Some of them are more general, like this one by Lillesand, and some are more specific, for example, the one on kernel methods, or this one about the remote sensing image processing chain. You can also find books on specific type of sensors, like these two about hyperspectral data, or this one about topographic LiDAR. Now that you have ideas, that you have all the bases, maybe you will need some code. And in this we can help with the ISP Valencia MATLAB suite, where you can find a lot of algorithms implemented for you in a simple to use and intuitive way about feature selection with the SIMFIT toolbox, about regression or retrieval with the simple R toolbox, and classification with the simple class toolbox. There is also coming soon a full database of images called HyperLabelMe. So just you know, keep in touch and you will uh, get them soon. Finally, if you really need uh, a lot of data, uh, I cannot but recommend the website of the Image Analysis and Data Fusion Technical Committee of the IEEE. The committee hosts every year a data fusion contest where a data set, a challenging data set with multiple modalities is released, and we ask people all over the world to perform some processing tasks. So here is the website of the technical committee, and here you can actually find most of the data used on the past con contests. We actually leave them available so that the people can continue download them and use them. So have a look and find the data you, you, you need along with the ground routes and uh, the experiences of the other participants. Say that, I 
I would like to thank you for listening to this tutorial and I hope you, you enjoyed it and it will inspire you in your future research. If you need anything, our emails are here and just contact us anytime. Thank you very much.